Hey, good morning, Restoration friends. So glad to be with you this morning, whether in person or online. Today is the third Sunday of Advent, and so we have lit the pink candle, which represents joy. Here's what we learn from Luke chapter 2, the birth narrative of Jesus. The angels have approached the shepherds. They were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. And Matthew picks up from there, and he says, And you shall name him Jesus because he will take the sins of the world away. Great joy for all who would hear the name of Jesus, because salvation has come. We're going to reflect on this beautiful name this morning, this wonderful name, this powerful name, Jesus, the one who takes away the sin of the world. Would please stand for those who are in person and join us and glorifying his name. Salvation. 
Father, thank you for the name of Jesus. The knee that, uh, the, the name that, um, at the very mention of it, every knee shall bow in tongue on earth and under the earth. The name given to our Savior, Father, because he would save his people from their sins. Father, thank you for your great love that is shown and expressed so magnificently in the Christmas season. Seeing us in our great time of need, you came near to us to save us from our sins. We thank you, Father, that it is not by our own goodness and our own abilities, but simply by your grace compelled by your great love that you have saved us. And so we glorify your name and we lift you high this morning. And we pray this in the matchless name of Jesus. Amen. You may take a seat. Restoration Church, go. in person and online. There you go. For some reason, that took like four tries to get that out. I don't know why. It's late. I think that's why. And we have a middle schooler playing Among Us very yeah, loudly in the other room. Yeah, we're like, mm -hmm. this can't be. Yep. Uh, if you're a guest with us this morning, you've been around maybe a little while, you're ready to let us know who you are, we'd encourage you to fill out the connection card that's dropping in the comments if you're online. If you're with us in person, you can go out to the lobby after the service. And we have a gift for you for telling us who you are. Um, it's a wonderful mug which is great for this time of the season don't you think year season sure. season yeah mm -hmm. and um we also we have give, good plans we also give three dollars to the interfaith food alliance so just by telling us who you are and a little bit about yourself you are making the difference in people within our community i want to know if anyone has tried a hot cocoa bomb this it's all, year it's all kind the rage of thing. It's we all bought the rage some this year. we're going to try them this weekend we probably already will have done that by sunday maybe i'll have to report live in person mm -hmm. how good they were mm-hmm mm -hmm. But I heard a lot of our people are like trying to make them. So it's all the rage. Yeah, it's you the hot item. mug. It's a good mug for that. That's right. It's mm -hmm. cool. But so, we are really glad you're here. Yeah. What's going on? Uh, Christmas. Christmas. <laughs> Christmas. <laughs> you want to talk about Christmas? We do. First? We do want to talk about Christmas first. Um, Today is the third Sunday of Advent. It is. So. We're glad you're here Important, for that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So Chris, Christmas Eve is really our big thing. Which means we only have one more Sunday and then it's Christmas Eve. Crazy. Our kids are so excited. Yeah, anybody's kids off their rockers right yeah, now. Yeah. Okay. It's not just us, it can't be us. Let's just talk about that. Christmas Eve. So we have um we have opportunities for every comfort level available. Um, comfort level meaning what? Meaning if you want to stay at home and watch mm. us online mm -hmm. because um, maybe you're not comfortable being in larger crowds, even though we do everything within our power to keep this context of being live and in person, very, honestly, very safe. Honestly, church is like the place I feel the safest. Yep, yep. Because I trust and know that everyone's wearing their mask. Yep. And we are socially distant. Socially distant. And we contact trace. Yep. So. And there's sanitizing stations all over the place. I mean, yeah. we, we've done a ton of work to make sure that this is a very, very safe context for you to be. And so mm -hmm. we really do encourage you to come back if you're ready. But um, we, we options, understand that if you're not, Online is very much an option at 4 and 11 p.m. on Christmas Eve. That's also our in-person option. We also have an in-person indoors option at 4 o'clock mm -hmm. and 11 o'clock. Although 4 o'clock may be at capacity by it, Sunday. It, it may be, you're right. So if, if you really want to be at one of these services, you need to sign up quickly. Yeah. But there's also an outdoor option at 6 p.m. on Christmas Eve, assuming that it's not like sleeting or freezing rain on us. Um, if the weather <laughs> permits, if it's a nice, beautiful snowfall, we're still going to go through with it. But... You're gonna be there all by yourself. It's gonna be it's gonna be magical that way, but um, we are gonna be doing an outdoor service. So bundle up, come mm -hmm. on out, candle lighting just like inside. It's gonna be a really beautiful night, I think. So that's Christmas Eve. We really encourage you sign up early, sign up register. soon. When you register. say sign up, you yes, mean I mean register. register. Yes, I do. And you can find those links on our website or in the church center app. And if there's not a link, it's because the service has reached capacity. So join us online there you if go. your time is filled up. We'd love to have you there. Yeah, that's right. Right. Yep. Okay, that's Christmas. That's What's Christmas. happening right after Christmas, Ross? 
So on the 27th and January 3rd, we are going to be online only. So there is no live in-person option that day. There's either, a lot there's either a, of those Sundays. There's yeah. a lot of reasons we're doing that, which we'll probably communicate in writing at some point soon. Mm -hmm. um, but we really do encourage you to join us. We're going to be talking about uh, what 2020 has been, kind of saying goodbye to 2020 and hello to 2021. Mm -hmm. What is coming up in 2021 for Restoration Church, new opportunities, new ways to connect, all sorts of fun things coming up in 2021. So we're gonna say goodbye to 2020 and hello to 2021 for those two weeks online only at 10 a.m. So really do encourage you to join us there. Mm -hmm. Cool, so the last thing that we wanna do today is that we want to highlight everything that's happened the last three weeks or so. Yeah, four weeks almost. Yeah, the last month point, yeah. with Be Rich. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because we kind of lost the like, here's the whole impact because it's been spread out. So we want to make sure that you know what the impact has been. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And celebrate that. We want to thank our Be Rich team that has been led by Linda Penny this mm -hmm. year. Yeah, great job, um, guys. We're going to try to say the names. And if we miss someone, should we not say them? Um... We're going to miss someone, certainly. We're going to miss many people, <laughs> probably. Say, we're just going to say thank you to the Be Rich team. Yes. You know who you are. And everybody yeah, and this. everybody who participated, we had 100, okay, probably 100. Okay, stop. You're going to do pastor math. So, you're going to say hundreds of volunteers. I was going to say 100 volunteers. <laughs> that might be close, but <laughs> okay. <laughs> Lots of people came uh, to participate in Be Rich, and so we're so thankful. Yes. Because not only did people come to serve at the events, but... We, we have no idea who gave and how many people gave and how many people donated well, items. We, so did hundred, hundreds of people participate? Absolutely. Yes. Just right. maybe not serving at the events, but absolutely hundreds, hundreds of people participated. Go ahead. What are we going to say? Well, just to give a little picture, you're going to th throw some pictures up while we talk through this. Uh, yeah. Right? Yep. So the first thing that kicked off for us um, was the roadside cleanup. Mm -hmm. And just so that you guys know, we have adopted Hood Boulevard. Boulevard yeah. And we had 12 volunteers go out of all ages to help clean up that roadside. Yep. Right? That Good was done. one of our first things. Yep. We. It's amazing how much trash we actually collected mm -hmm. on yep. one road. <laughs> like yep. 12 or 15 bags of trash. Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. Um, then we had the Laundry Love event. Ooh, yeah. Which you love. Yeah. Laundry Love. We, we paid for $1,500 worth of laundry. Mm-hmm. T had tons of great conversations, mm -hmm. um, met a lot of new friends. A lot of people were just totally perplexed and shocked as to why we would do it. Yeah. And um, I love when people ask questions about free things because it gives us an open door to talk about the free grace of God. And so mm -hmm. I, I personally Generous. I personally had numerous conversations with people, just the, the simplicity of the gospel cool. to, to kind of tie in the free laundry to the gospel, which is really, really cool. Oh, you're so good at that. <laughs> <laughs> we had 16 volunteers for a reason. You stop. We had 16 volunteers, true. That helped with the, us at Laundry Love. I'm trying to like give my staff 16 here, volunteers. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm yeah, sorry. It's fine. Yeah, it's yeah. fine. It's good. We had the diaper give, which actually turned into the gives. The because games. we ended up doing two of them. We did, yeah. Um, we gave away over 20,000 diapers and 30,000 wipes. Yeah. We had, we counted up over 31 volunteers that ended up helping with that. And we think we served close to 115 family units. Yeah, so pretty cool. So that's really awesome. Yeah, that's right. um, and then there's something that we haven't talked very much about, but it definitely happened. What am I going to say? Do you know? The bags. The blessing bags. The blessing bags for the homeless and those in need. Um, Eve Dahl helped to organize that project, and we collected over 90 bags that will be distributed to the homeless. Yeah. yeah so that's super cool. Yeah. Oh, and the IFA, the whole Thanksgiving thing was like the very beginning. Tons too. of, yeah. Tons of pounds of food yeah. were, were given and a lot of clothing was donated too. Oh, and that's so. just the good stuff thrift project. See, you guys are awesome. And we didn't even talk about the giving tree yet. Um, I go ahead. Can you talk about the giving tree? Uh, for a yeah. So we, I we, pull up my stats. we have adopted, um, 15 families completely. Um, over 51, 40, nope, 51, 51 kids. kids. Wow. And awesome. that's 26 sponsors. Awesome. So 26 of our restoration friends helped pitch in for that. Love that. So really cool. So I did, I did do a little bit of math today and, um, all in all about $15,000 went into wow. our, went back into our community that's um, awesome. in the month of December. So that's awesome. we gave back $15,000 in various ways. So yeah, we can clap for that. thank you so very much. Mm -hmm. We love how generous Restoration Church is and how we continue to make God known because of what we're doing. So yeah, super fun month. Um, and, uh, anything else you want to say about Beer Rich? Or is that good? I, yeah, no. Okay. 
It's after eight o'clock, guys, and I go to bed now. So I'm, out, I'm actually <laughs> really, really out of words. Up. He has more words than I do at this time. Just get going. Come on. I know you are. But I am gonna I'm gonna say a prayer because the reason that we um, are generous is because we serve a very generous God. Mm -hmm. The whole series we're in right now, Word Made Flesh, is all about mm -hmm. emulating God. And there's one of those words you're gonna be like, who uses no, words emulating like emulating? Is fine. Yeah. It's fine. It is a little awkward. But. <laughs> well. <laughs> We um, exemplify God, right? Because we try to live our lives like God lives his. And so um, because God is generous, we try to be generous as well. Mm -hmm. And we find a lot of joy and blessing in being generous. But um, yeah, if, I bet you guys have some experiences of oh, joy absolutely. through that, right? Yeah, yeah. When you're giving, just yeah. how much of a blessing it is to you, the giver, right? Yeah, yep. mm -hmm. It's more That's blessed to give than to receive, That's right. Jesus said. Um, anyway, so uh, we we continue to exist off the generosity of our people. There are five easy ways to continue to give to Restoration Church. Uh, they're up here on the screen. The fifth one, of course, is for those of you who are in person, the drop box in the back of the church. So mm -hmm. um, I'm going to say prayer for us, and then we're going to continue on with our time of worship. Don't forget that people are really having a hard time with the whole COVID thing right now. Yes, yes. Okay. You can pray about that. Okay, for us sure. Too? Yes, okay. yeah. All right. Heavenly Father, you are our healer, um, you are our shalom, our peace, our restorer, and uh, you hold us together. And so even in a global pandemic, we pray that uh, you would be near us, sustaining us, and uh, continuing to uh, provide us the, the means we need to be generous and to help those who, who are struggling right now. Mm -hmm. Thank you for how you've been good to us, and I pray that we'll continue to be good to others. Mm. We pray this in your name. Amen. Amen. Hey, real quick, for those of you who uh, may wanted to participate in the Giving Tree, but you uh, maybe went there and there weren't any tags left, we added six tags to the Giving Tree this morning. And it's really more like, what, 18 or 19 families, 20 families even at this point, 60 plus kids. I mean, yeah, we, we continue to, to receive um, applications and, and people who are in need of providing a happy Christmas for their family. So if you are uh, able and interested in helping with the Giving Tree, continue to check back because there are always going to be opportunities to do that. Hey, we're in a series, uh, the third week of a series, titled The Word Became Flesh. When John, the, the uh, Apostle John, the disciple John, uh, penned these words in chapter one of his gospel, he meant a lot of things by the idea of the word becoming flesh, but certainly what he meant was that Jesus, the flesh part, embodies God, the self-revelation, the very mind, the very heart of God. And so if you're wondering what God is like, John would say, hey, look at Jesus. Jesus is the embodiment, the exact representation of God. And because Jesus is the very image of God, and we were made in the image of God, if you're wondering what it means to be genuinely human, he would also say, hey, look at Jesus. If you want to know what it really means to be human upon this planet, right, designed and living as we were created and functioning as we were created to live, then look at how Jesus lived his life. Live your life like that, and my friends, you will be happiest. You will be most full of joy. You will be most satisfied. You will live your life, your life like you were designed to live your life. I mentioned throughout this series that COVID has, been, has not been kind to the world in a lot of ways outside of the disease itself. Uh, that has done so much horror to the world. But studies have shown that since March, we are less kind, less patient, less content, less happy, more angry, more greedy, more judgmental, more self-justifying, more blame-shifting. In every felt and studied category, humans, for the most part, are worse off. Consider this Gallup poll that just came out this week. This is the uh, how well you are doing mentally. Uh, they asked all of these various questions. Notice how, you can't even see the top of this, which I apologize. Um, notice how every single category is negative from last year to this year. So the left category represents 2019. The middle, ca the middle number is the 2020. And then the other category is the difference between those two. But notice how every single category, it doesn't matter if you're white or black or married or unmarried, Republican, Democratic, whatever, every single category is worse off this year than last year, except, do you guys notice this? Those who attend church, those who come and make that effort to be here every single week, you guys are doing better than the norm. Now, of course, this goes to those, it's just religious 
ceremonies, religious celebrations. So um, Muslim, Jewish people, anybody who is attending regularly weekly services, for the most part, are doing better than the other. But all this goes to show us is that the world is worse off than it was a year ago. We are worse off as humans than we were a year ago. And all of this, and so much more beyond this, this affects our relationships, doesn't it? It's not just that we're just isolated individuals and we're only hurting ourselves, but all of this negative mental energy and this mental states and the worse off that we are, it affects one another. All of these behaviors and these thoughts that we have bundled up inside of our head that we now let breathe during COVID, they affect others. They bump up against you and they bump up against my neighbors and they bump against my in-laws and my spouse and my children and my friends. See, one of the reasons COVID has been so hard on so many is because our reactions, our choices, our behaviors, our they're not just isolated, but they bleed and they bump up against others and they hurt others in the process. Many of whom, these people, we can't escape because we are quarantined with them. We're stuck in the same house with them. And so we're constantly bumping up against people and we don't have many outlets. And my hope for you this Christmas is that you would learn to become like Jesus because I think this will help you live your best life Move beyond having your behavior and your attitude dictated by your circumstances, which is a lot of the reasons why we're doing worse off mentally is because we just we don't know how to navigate the circumstance very well. But if we could become like Jesus, we would transcend living by our circumstances. At all times, my hope, is you, my hope for you is that we would learn to love as we have been loved by God. There's really no greater verse, I think, that exemplifies what this series is all about, that we want to live like God lives, and he has certainly loved us, and so we ought to love one another. Or that we would do, as Paul said specifically, to follow God's example by walking in the way of love. That is really my hope for you this Christmas. I think that it would provide the happiest and most joyful context for you to enjoy this season and to live life well if we could learn to do this. It seems love is actually what it means to live like God. Love is what it means then to be genuinely human. Of course, that takes a lot of unpacking, which we don't have time to do. Some other time we will do that. See, COVID doesn't justify ill treatment of another person. You guys know that, right? Just because our circumstances are hard, COVID does not justify blame shifting. COVID doesn't justify treating other people rudely. COVID doesn't justify any ill attitude or behavior towards another person, even though we kind of hang our attitude and our anger and our lack of patience and our rudeness up on the whole COVID shelf and we say, well, if circumstances were different, I would treat you differently. If circumstances were different, then I would act differently. If circumstances were different, then I would be different or I would behave differently. And my friends, COVID doesn't justify any of that. Let us learn to transcend our circumstances and say, what would it look like to love even amidst challenging circumstances. What would it mean to live like God and therefore be genuinely human? But that's a hard word in 2020, isn't it? This year, as we all know, has been a year like no other, and our relationships have been under attack. Think of everything that has demanded a stance or an opinion in 2020. We went through a brutal, polarizing political season that seemed to reach its dirty little hands into a million other issues, didn't it? There was racial upheaval that began in the Midwest and made its way around the globe. There were debates about the reality and the seriousness of the disease. Masks, right, the little things that we put upon our face to cover our nose and our mouth, these have torn families apart. These have torn relationships apart. Your opinion of them, bumping up against somebody else's opinion of them, and all of a sudden you seem to, how did this thing get in between us? And yet, it does, right? The holidays and gathering together as families brought about ridicule and judgment. Parents' decisions to send their kids back to school brought about criticism and judgment. For many, there's this general feeling of being judged about X, Y, and Z for every decision that we make. And now, mundane discussions between couples and households are like, hey, should we send our child to that play date? And all of a sudden, this becomes like a life or death issue. And that will inevitably put families under strain and relationships to the test. We are in a high-pressure environment of confinement and combine this with the financial stress of a burdened economy and a record number of marriages are under conflict and experiencing great conflict. This year has seen an unprecedented number of divorce requests. 
throughout the world. Add to that what we talked about last week, how we're in a perpetual state of mourning, and we're feeling isolated, and we're less kind, and we're more easily angered, and we're saying things that we wouldn't normally say in normal circumstances, and therefore we're hurting people in unique and fresh ways because of the new and fresh circumstances. And no matter what you say or where you stand, you're destined to offend someone, aren't you? No matter where you, what you say or where you stand, you're destined to hurt somebody. Our relationships are hurting and our relationships are strained. Maybe some of you are feeling this more than others. Maybe you actually feel this personally and physically, and these aren't just hypotheticals, but you had maybe a great relationship during the political season, and you said something about one person, and they took offense to it, and now they don't want to talk to you anymore. Or they saw how you gathered with 15 people for Thanksgiving, and they're like, I don't want anything to do with you anymore. You're a disease spreader. And we say things like this, and we wouldn't normally say things like this, but in this heated context, in this environment that we're living in, we say things that we wouldn't normally say, and we are hurting people in ways that we wouldn't normally hurt people. Add to that that we had hopes and dreams that have been delayed or dashed, and we feel lazy and unaccomplished, and we feel guilty that we didn't do more or say more or interject when we had the chance. And so I'm at odds with myself. I'm at odds with my wife. I'm at odds with my kids. I'm at odds with my coworkers and my used-to-be friends, and I'm at odds with God because certainly he should have done something about this. Relationships are strained. Relationships are hurting. And here's what I need you to understand this morning. Grace covers everything. But grace will not tolerate being abused. Grace will either transform us or we will transform grace. And when we transform grace, it becomes religion. And religion will never save us and religion will never heal us. Healing, the healing that you need so desperately, and I think the healing that you so desperately want, is available to you, and this morning I want to show you how. I've shared some of these thoughts with you before, but there are some certain conversations that I think we need to have on a more regular basis because we tend to forget them, and in situations like this when relationships are so strained, I'm hoping that this relationship will fall upon maybe new ears and new contexts, and you can apply it perhaps, to some of those strained relationships. We live in a broken, fallen world, and because of this, we have both offended others, but we've also been offended, haven't we? I mean, come on, we need to just humble ourselves a minute and acknowledge that this is true. Yes, I have offended other people, but I've also been offended, right? We live on both sides of the valley. And because this is the case, we are concealed, I think, within two cages, I've used this analogy before. The outer cage and therefore the first cage that must be dealt with, though, is the cage of innocence, right? You can't start working on that inner cage until you unlock that outer cage and get that outer cage out of the way. And I'm going to call this outer cage our innocence, right? It's the belief that I have no need to apologize because I've done nothing wrong. It's the belief that, you know what? Yeah, there's a lot of tension here. There's a lot of strain in this relationship, but I've done nothing wrong. It's all your fault. You're the one to blame. I'm going to point my finger at you. I'm not the one to blame. I'm convinced myself that I'm okay, and so I point the finger and I blame shift. It's the belief that I don't have to take ownership of any of the hurt in this relationship. It's the belief that I haven't done anything to contribute to the chaos or to the strain of this relationship. It's everybody else's fault. It's the belief that we're innocent. And all forgiveness, whether it be forgiving someone else or forgiving ourselves, must begin not with how we have been offended, but rather with how we have been offenders. This is, my friends, where it begins. This is where healing begins. It seems backwards. It seems kind of nonsensical, but my friends, you have to acknowledge that this is where it begins. Not with how I have been offended, but how I have been an offender. If you want to be free from the pain in your stomach, you know how that feels, that knot that gets tied up in your stomach? If you want to be free from the guilt in your soul, the conviction of your mind, the stress, the anxiety that comes with harboring pain and anger and bitterness, then you must realize that it begins with you and how you have been an offender, not how you have been offended. And if you keep shaking off your responsibility and blaming others and saying it's their fault or it's her fault or it's his fault and not taking ownership of your contribution to the problem, then, my friends, you'll never be free. 
Because the first cage that must be dealt with is the outer cage of our innocence. So let's take a deep breath, and I want you to try owning something this morning. Own the fact that you are a dirty, rotten, filthy sinner. You must own it, believe it, admit it, understand it, but do not stay locked away in self-pity. Do not wallow in self-mourning. The grace of God is bigger than our sin. You must recognize that, and you must believe that as well. And I don't care what you have done. I don't care how bad you have hurt other people. I don't care how horrible you think your sin is, my friends. The grace of God is bigger, way bigger than all of it. And after you come to that conclusion that you are a contributor to the hurt, that you must take ownership of your part in the equation, seek out the ones that you have offended, and ask for their forgiveness. Because when you do that, that outer cage of innocence will be flung open, and you will now have the capacity to begin to deal with the cage of how you have been hurt. And you might be thinking, well, why, I, why am I imprisoned when somebody else hurts me? But have you ever had a relationship that is broken and because they wronged you, you know, you see that person in the grocery, in the grocery store and you're like, oh, okay, I'm going to beeline it for the aisle next to me. I don't want to interact with that person. Yeah, they've hurt me, but I don't want to see them. I don't want to interact with them, and so I'm going to go in the complete opposite direction. I'm going to avoid them at all cost. Or you see a picture of that person, and your stomach gets tied up in knots, or you hear that person's name in conversation, and your heart starts racing. You guys ever been there before? Yeah, I've been there. And you seethe with anger, and this anger spills out in your spouse, and it spills out in your children, and it spills out in your coworkers. And this thing that happened, you know, it could have been 20 years ago. Or it could have been a week ago, and this thing that happens, it, it begins to kind of take over your attitude and your behavior, and you can feel it in you, and it's changing you, and you hate it, but that is a cage, my friends. That's an imprisonment. And the solution is forgiveness. You see, it releases you from the cage of hurt. And the reason that you need to acknowledge your own guilt before you address how you've been hurt is because forgiveness is a divine gift given to us that we must first be given before we can begin to give it away. Forgiveness is a divine gift that has been handed to us graciously from our Heavenly Father. And before we can give it away, we must acknowledge that it has been given. See, forgiveness doesn't mean that it didn't happen or it didn't really matter. Forgiveness is when it did happen and it does matter and you're going to deal with it and you're going to end up loving and accepting the other person Anyway, it means releasing the other person from the debt of their offense. They are not responsible to pay you back. Forgiveness is re erasing a wrong with love because love does not keep score, Paul wrote the Corinthians. Love does not keep score. Wait, and remember that God is love, and being like God is to be loving, and to be genuinely human is to be loving, and so love does not keep score. What does that mean with those people who have hurt you? Love does not keep score. Love does not keep a tally. Love does not hold other people's wrongs over their head. Love doesn't keep score. Love doesn't have a filing drawer full of all the times that you have hurt me. See, once forgiveness is offered, we make a choice, and yes, forgiveness is a choice to make. To put the issue in the past is yesterday's burden, understanding that today is a new reality with a very fresh start. What's in the past is finished. The matter is closed. We can't hold wrongs over people's heads. We do not keep score. As Peter is taking this, Peter is the, one of Jesus' very close disciples, very close friends. He's taking all this in. And he begins thinking, Jesus, if this is true, okay, everything that you've, you've been talking to us and teaching us, well, how many times... Shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? Thinking that he's all self-righteous. Seven times I will forgive my brother. That's what the law tells us. Because Jesus, it kind of sounds like you're telling me just to kind of be steamrolled through all this. I need to constantly be forgiving, constantly be forgiving, constantly be forgiving. That I need to be the bigger man, and I always need to take the high road, and I need to keep letting them abuse me. That's what forgiveness means, it seems like, Jesus. As a Christian, that must be my motto in life, to be a martyr, constantly forgiving, never keeping score. And Jesus responds, well, Peter, 
you're actually not seeing the flaw in your position, right? Uh, if all you're doing is keeping a tally of all the number of times that you've been offended so that after you get to that seventh time, you feel justified in picking up that stick and doing some damage, that's really all you're doing. If you keep counting score, at some point you're going to get, hey, they've, they've abused me seven times. Now I'm justified in hurting you. Now I'm justified in not inviting you. Now I'm justified in treating you adversely because I have forgiven you seven times and now I'm free to do with you what I will. All you're really doing when you do that is postponing revenge. All you're doing is delaying your revenge, but love does not keep score. And so no, Peter, Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 70 times, seven times. And that's just Jesus' way of saying, you are never free from your responsibility to forgive someone. Never. You are never free from your responsibility to forgive someone who has wronged you. But what this doesn't mean is that we should dismiss wrongs committed against us. It does not mean that we should commit wrongs that we have committed against other people as if they didn't matter. See, when conf- confrontation has to happen, and I believe strongly in confrontation, it does need to happen, but it should always be with forgiveness in mind, never revenge. It should always be with reconciliation as the hope, never revenge. Forgiveness doesn't mean that you have to be best friends with someone afterward. Forgiveness doesn't mean that a relationship will be mended or reconciled. Forgiveness and reconciliation are actually two very different things. And if someone keeps abusing you without humility, then, then Jesus said actually just before this conversation with Peter, he says that you should treat those kind of people like pagans. It, it doesn't mean that you should seek their revenge. It doesn't mean that you should seek their harm. It doesn't mean that you're justified in abusing them or treating them poorly. It simply means that you have the right to not interact with them anymore. You, you have the right to excommunicate them from your community. You do not have to keep putting yourself in those contexts of abuse. Expel them. Pray for them, yes, but do not tolerate their, ju- their, uh, their, their abuse against you. See, Peter's problem was that he was not approaching his offenders with the right attitude, partially because Peter didn't understand how tightly sealed that outer cage of innocence was. And so to help Peter understand this, he tells them this story. It's a story that many of us know, especially those of us who have read the Bible before. The story that Jesus tells is this. The kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. And as he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. So the king of ki- the kingdom has made a public call for all the collection of all the debts that all the people owed the king. And so one by one, heads of households are brought before the king to pay back what they owed. And if they cannot pay it back, then the king will repossess their property, leaving them absolutely desolate. And in this case, a man was brought before the king who owed him 10,000 talents. Jesus is making a very, very bold point here. A single talent was worth 15 years' wages of a day laborer. And this man owed 10,000 talents. I don't know what he did, how many casinos he visited, and what he gambled away to get in this kind of debt. But this, o- this man owed the equivalent, the modern-day equivalent of roughly $10 billion. That's a lot of money. But we can fathom that, right? I mean, we can fathom, come on, what, our national debt's, what, $25 trillion right now? We can fathom $10 billion. It's a lot of money, yeah, but we can understand it. But what we need to realize is that in the first century Roman world, the highest figure in arithmetic was 10,000. They had no context for a number higher than 10,000. It was like saying infinity today. And not only that, the talent was the highest form of currency in their day, which we can't really understand either since most of our money is digitalized. But the point Jesus is trying to make is that this man never would have been able to pay back the king. This man had a debt that was so infinite, he would never be able to pay back the king. An infinite, unimaginable debt. There was literally no way, even if an infinite number of years were provided him to pay off his debt, he could never, in a million, trillion, infinite lifetimes, ever pay back the debt that he owed the king. And this is Jesus' point. And since he was not able to pay... The master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. And at this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay you back everything. No, you won't. But we try that, right? We we try that. I will work it off. I will do what is necessary. I will try. And here's what's so marvelous about this story. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, 
and let him go. Of course, Jesus is hoping that we see ourselves in this, that we understand that this man represents every single one of us. We have accrued an infinite debt against our God. The depth of our sin is unimaginably deep, and there is no way, even if we were given an infinite, innumerable number of lifetimes to pay God back, we could never pay God back. There is nothing that we can do. There is no prayers that could ever be said, no church attendance, no confessions made or money given or works done that could ever pay God back what we owe him. We could never tip the scale in our favor, my friends. It is impossible to tip the scale in our favor. And one of the main reasons that people stay locked away in an inability to forgive themselves primarily is because they try and pay back their debt to their offender. They can't forgive themselves because they don't have the resources or capacity to pay back their debt. Or maybe that relationship actually doesn't exist anymore. And therefore, they can't mend that relationship. And so they think, well, this prison is now my penance. I've done this thing, and this prison is actually now what I deserve. And though, though it may be true that we deserve imprisonment, the sheer act of grace, your debt is canceled, and you are let go. By the sheer act of grace, your debt is canceled, and you are let go, my friends. We have been forgiven. Incredible. We didn't earn it. None of us deserve it. But it is available to each one of us. And so I want you to just sit in that reality for a moment. We're not going to move too, pa- too far, too, too quickly past this. I need you to sit in this reality for a moment simply as an act of grace. You do not earn it. You do not deserve it. There is nothing that you could ever do, in fact, to earn it or to deserve it. But you are forgiven. You are forgiven. Forgiven, sit in that moment for just a moment. But also notice how the story continues. When the servant went out, the same servant that had been forgiven, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And he grabbed him and he began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. Now a denarii was a day's wage. And this man, having owed 100 of them, owed the modern-day equivalent of roughly $10,000. It's still a lot of money. It's still a pretty big debt. But the man responds in the same manner as the first man. Right? The man who owed an infinite, remember, the man who owed an infinite number of debt to the king pleaded and begged. And by the mercy of the king, he was forgiven. And so his fellow servant, who owed him $10,000, roughly Uh, came and and he fell to his knees and he begged him, please be patient with me, I will pay you back. But the man refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. The point is rather obvious, isn't it? We have accrued an infinite debt against God and yet we've been forgiven. And yet how often do we hold other people's debts against them? How often do we hold other people's misdealings and wrongs against them, enslaving them to their debt and enslaving ourselves to our innocence in the process? And my friends, I know that the wrongs that have been committed against you, they don't feel petty. They don't feel small. They don't feel insignificant. I mean, there are people who have done unimaginably unspeakable evils to people. And we need to call sin what it is, and we need to call evil what it is. I get that. But please understand that every time we accuse someone, we bring to light a very important truth, a very personal truth about ourselves, that we too are sinners in need of grace. And if you want to understand the beauty of this story, then you have to place yourself in in the story as the one who had the infinite, unimaginable debt against the king that he could never repay but was extended such a brilliant mercy. You need to put yourself into his position. You will never be free unless you can own that, but also own the fact that you have been forgiven. Own it, believe it, admit it, claim it, because it's true you have been forgiven. Therefore, forgive others. You have been forgiven. Therefore, forgive others. You have been forgiven. Therefore, forgive others. 
Paul wrote this to the Ephesians. Be kind. Be compassionate to one another. Forgiving one another. Why? Why should I forgive the person who has hurt me? Why should I forgive that person who has done such an unspeakable, unimaginable evil to me? Why? Because God has forgiven you. He wrote to the Colossians. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, why? Why should I forgive someone if I have a grievance against them? Why should I forgive someone who has hurt me? Because God's forgiven you. See, nobody in this world has committed such a grievant offense against you as you have committed against God, and yet you stand before God forgiven. See, at this point, Peter is probably beginning to realize a few things. He really didn't want to be steamrolled or abused, and so he developed a vengeful mentality, doing his duty as a follower of Jesus, forgiving his wrongdoer seven times, just waiting until that eighth offense when he had the find the, the justification to grab that stick and do some damage against them. But Peter, right, as foolish as Peter was, like we all are, Peter too has been met with such an incredible grace. And if we don't claim the position as the person who has been forgiven of such an infinite debt as the man in the story was, we'll never be transformed, my friends. We'll never be transformed. And we'll always just take grace and transform it for our own use and our own abuse. We'll never find the strength then also to forgive those who have wronged us. And so here's the harsh truth. If we refuse to take up that position as the man who has been met with such an incredible grace, saved by an incredible grace, there is an incredible ruin waiting us. The story continues. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were outraged and they went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. And can he pay back all that he owes? No. He is infinitely in debt to the king. And this is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother or your sister from your heart. Now, many people look at this last statement and that you will not be forgiven unless you forgive and dismiss it because we think the power of the gospel is greater than that. Isn't God's love for us greater than that? God can't override this failing as he does with every other failing. Why can't God override this sin like he can override so many other sins? And, and maybe can't is too strong of a word, but I don't think that he will. It's a choice of his to say that he will. And I think the reason is because, you know, forgiveness isn't like a Christmas present that a kindly old grandfather can give a grandchild, even if that grandchild refuses to give a gift to anybody else. That's foolish, but, you know, that can be overlooked. It's not like the, the meal waiting for us at home, even if while our way home we pass by the person standing outside that restaurant asking for food as we go home to that nice hot meal upon a plate. I mean, that's foolish perhaps. It's not kind. It's not loving, but we can overlook that. God's love transcends all that foolishness, but forgiveness is altogether different than that. Forgiveness is like the air in your lungs. Everyone take a deep breath for me for just a moment. Fill up those lungs. Notice that there's only room for you to inhale your next lungful when you've only exhaled the previous one. That's what forgiveness is like. That's what God is saying, what Jesus is saying in this parable, what forgiveness is like. If you insist on withholding forgiveness or refusing to extend it to someone else who desperately is in need of it, you won't be able to take in any more yourself. I'm going to invite the band forward. We're going to sing a final song as we reflect on this for one more minute. Jesus is kind of like saying, guys, the door to forgiveness is either open or it's closed. If it's open, able, and willing to forgive others, then it'll be open to receiving the forgiveness that God offers you as well. But if it is locked up to forgiving others who have wronged you, then it will be locked up to you as well, and you will not be able to receive the forgiveness of God. Hard word this morning, but I hope that you can apply these to your relationships, who I think probably you are experiencing are strained, maybe even some are broken right now. So the question we're asking ourselves is, what does this tell us about God? 
It tells us that God's grace is extended even to those who we would consider enemies. And so, my friends, if that is true, if God just lavishly pours out grace, generously pours out grace, even on those whom we would consider enemies, friends, we then must do the same. And if, what does this tell us about being genius, genuinely human? Well, we have no right to withhold grace. And we will be most at peace and we will be most joy-filled if we can learn to pour out grace and forgiveness generously, even on those who have wronged us. And so a couple of things for you to ponder as we conclude our time together. First, I want you to realize that you have been forgiven of an infinite debt by the shed blood of Jesus Christ. You need to own this. You need to believe this. He paid an infinite price for you so that you could be free of an infinite debt. This is where all paths to forgiveness must begin. Second, ask yourself if your attitude towards those who have wronged you is revenge or forgiveness. And if your attitude is revenge, then go back and revisit point number one. If it is forgiveness, then ask yourself, number three, if there is anyone you need to confront in the spirit of forgiveness about how they've wronged you. Who out there has wronged you that you need to seek in a spirit of forgiveness? Seek out. Understanding, by the way, that they may have absolutely no idea that they've wronged you. You may have this angst and this burden in you, and they have absolutely no idea that they ever did anything wrong, but all they knew is that your relationship got awkward. And you've been holding this thing on for years, maybe. Is there anybody that you need to confront about how they have wronged you? If you're not sure, ask yourself, is there anybody who puts a bad taste in my mouth or an ache in my stomach or ties my stomach up in knots when I see them? when I think about them, when their name comes up in conversation. And lastly, understand that the reason a person may put a bad taste in your mouth might be because you have actually wronged them. And if that is the case, then humble yourself, admit that you were wrong, and do what your responsibility is by seeking their forgiveness. My friends, we can weather this global pandemic we can be stronger in the end, but it's going to take some work. If you have strained relationships, I would really, really strongly encourage you to go do the necessary work, empowered by the forgiveness and the grace that God has already extended to you. We're going to sing one final song. For those of you in person, would you please stand? We're going to conclude our time together and sing. God, I'm on my knees again. God, I'm begging, please again. I need you. Oh, I need you. Walking down these desert roads, water for my thirsty soul. I need you. Oh, I need you. Your forgiveness. It's like sweet, sweet honey on my lips. It's like the sound of a symphony to my ears. It's like holy water on my skin. Like holy water on my skin. Sin. I want to know about being born again. I need you. Oh God, I need you. So take me to that riverside. Take me under that ties. I need you. Oh God, I need you. Your forgiveness is like sweet, sweet honey. 
be on my lips like the sound of a symphony to my ears It's like holy water on my lips It's like holy water on my lips Well, I don't want to abuse your grace. God, I need it every day. It's the only thing that ever really makes me want to change. Well, I don't want to abuse your grace. God, I need it every day. It's the only thing that ever really makes me want to change. And I don't want to abuse your grace. God, I need it every day. It's the only thing that ever really makes me want to change. Your forgiveness is like sweet, sweet honey on my lips. It's like the sound of a symphony to my ears. It's like holy water. like holy water on my skin. It's like holy water. So Heavenly Father, we were in a pit infinitely deep that we had dug ourselves. And because of your great love for us, you came down and you scraped the bottom of that pit and you lifted us up. And you set us upon a sure foundation. And so why then, Father, would we take somebody who is wronged us? Yes. Hurt us? Yes. But condemn them forever. Why would we take the grace that you have given us and abuse it by not extending it to somebody who is in need of it? And why would we then not point them to the ultimate source of grace? Why would we not want their best and to help them experience a relationship with you that will ultimately free them from the pit that they too stand in? I pray that we might be a people who are for people. I pray that we might be a people who look at you, God, and the love that you show, and we would say, if that's what it means to live like God, then I'm going to go live like God. If that's what it means to be genuinely human, that's what I want. Because I know that when I live as I am designed and created to live, I will be happiest. And I will experience the greatest joys. So Father, do this in us and may we just be a great beacon of your grace. May your grace just spill out of this place as we go out into the world. And let us take the necessary steps, Father. The challenging, responsible steps of admitting when we have wronged somebody and being honest with how we've been wronged. May grace cover it all and transform it all for your kingdom and for your glory. We pray this in the matchless name, in the beautiful name, the wonderful name, the powerful name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you for joining us online today. We'll see you again next time. For those of you who are in person, you're welcome to take a seat. You'll just be excused in just a second. God bless everyone. We'll see you again next time.